So the mission of the Legatum Center is to support sustainable um, entrepreneur entrepreneurship in emerging markets. And our focus, um, since it's MIT, is on technology-driven entrepreneurship. So how can technologies, um, business model innovations, be used to scale impact in emerging markets? So that's just a little bit on my background and um, sort of how I <laughs> ran into Siraj and he invited me to be here today. Um, so I've been fortunate over the last three years to work with uh, many different student teams, um, working in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, um, South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, on their ventures, and so I've sort of accumulated a couple of pointers along the way um, on how to pitch and give presentations. Um, so this format is um, kind of really just informational, it's conversational, um, so if you have questions along the way, feel free to stop me. Um, I'll try to PDF the slides after this um, and send them to Siraj so you have them for reference. Um, so we're kind of just adjusting this, but um, I'll go through a couple of pointers on pitching, um, a few things to keep in mind with presentations, and then we'll have an opportunity for a practice exercise. All right. Um, every pitch is going to be a little bit different. You know, you can't compare Unchained's pitch with ESG factors. Um, your pitch is also going to vary depending on your audience, um, which member of your team is speaking, whether your whole team is speaking or whether one of you is going up on the stage. Um, it's not your whole business plan, <laughs> so don't try to squeeze your whole business plan into your pitch. Um, you don't have to write your business plan on your slides and send it around in a deck. Um, it should really be about the things that are relevant to your audience um, that meet the criteria for you know, the competition, for the investor, whether you're recruiting team members. Um, and then you know, once you have a standard pitch you're comfortable with, you can adapt it for different audiences. Um, I'm sure you're all comfortable with PowerPoint and you can have one pitch or one slide deck and then hide your different slides and um, make changes as you go along. I will also say um, Peter Bray from the brand company um, is a consultant and he, his advice is to always be prepared to give your pitch or give your presentation without your slides because you may go somewhere and something may not connect, you may lose, you know, so those are just um, a few things. All right, so before you pitch, um, know your audience. Do as much background research as you can. Um, understand what motivates them. Why, you know, why are they an investor? Why are they interested in joining your team? Why are they interested in being a supply chain partner, um, a retail partner, or you know, working with you to um, fulfill their own mission as well as yours? So this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, it's just a, an interpretation. Probably everyone, everyone's somewhat familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, you know, it's a little um, simplified, but think about you know where um, you know kind of this is you know. But then kind of think about these top three things um, when you're pitching to your audience. So uh, yesterday I had an opportunity to meet with the CEO and founder of Clever Kid. Um, which was a company founded in India um, to help young mothers find after-school activities for their children. And so the challenge that um, Shabnam had, does, do you know Shabnam? <laughs> Is that why you're smiling? Okay. Um, but the challenge Shabnam had was that she built a company for, for mothers to find these activities for her children. She was pitching to investors who were mostly male and didn't know this was a problem. And so she would go into the room, she would give the pitch, and she would say, you know, are you concerned about what your child does after school? And they were sort of like, no, the mom does that. <laughs> so she had to figure out what, like, what did these investors care about and what motivated them to be interested in Clever Kid. And so she did some more research and she started framing it as, you know, do you care about where your children go to college? Do you care about what kind of opportunities they have in high school? Did you have a hobby or something that was important to you when you were a child? And how did you become interested in that? How did you develop that skill or talent? So she really had to find out what was important to her investor audience and then craft her presentation from that perspective. So it's understanding what you have to offer and then how that appeals um, to your audience. Um, this is from an article in the Harvard Business Review. Um, but basically, why should they care about what you're doing? Um, how does it change the world or improve lives? And how will they feel afterwards? So this is actually probably a good segue from the theory of change change session you just had. Um, but yeah, kind of thinking about that, you know, why is it important to the person 
um, you're trying to, to reach. Um, and then thinking about y taking a step back from your actual product or service and thinking about communicating your value proposition in your offering as a story. So um, these are two different representations of the story, again, um, both from HBR. So if you want to um, go back and take a look at the full article, I would definitely encourage you um, if you're not already familiar with this content. Um, so this is the persuasive pattern. And so you know, this is how things are with your product or service, they're going to get better. Um, so there's the beginning, the middle, and the, and the end. You know, this repeats, it doesn't have to repeat, but again, it depends on your um, product service offerings, your venture. Um, Kurt Vonnegut also um, has done something similar, and uh, he actually has a very funny YouTube sketch, so <laughs> um, if you're familiar with Kurt Vonnegut's work, um, and he has a dry sense of humor. But, you know, basically, um, I think in his YouTube sketch, he likens this to Cinderella. You could liken it to Dorothy of Oz or pretty much any story. But, um, you know, there's Cinderella is going along. Her life isn't that great. Um, you know, I guess she's down here. She meets the fairy godmother. She goes to the ball. This is fantastic. Um, the clock strikes midnight, and um, she loses her dress. She loses her shoe. Um, things are terrible, and then the prince finds her, and she ends up up here. And this is, you know, so you want to think about, you know, one day Joe used to go to work and he was tired, and then um, Starbucks opened up in his building, and he went to work, and then he wasn't tired anymore, and it just kept getting better. Um, so that's sort of, you know, when you think about your pitch, you know, this is the world as it is because you're filling a market need, but there's all, you know, there are many alternatives out there, and one of them is just not filling the need. So you want to make sure that what you're offering um, is better and has value. Um, all right, so now we're going to go into, these are kind of just, um, if you're going to pre present with a slide deck, um, thinking about how you're going to use those 10 slides. Um, the rule of thumb is probably no more than 10 slides in a slide deck with a pitch. Um, you maybe could go up to 16, probably definitely shouldn't go over 16. Um, so first of all, who is your customer? And I think you're all familiar with the um, disciplined entrepreneurship framework, so there are a couple of things in here. But um, who is your customer? So the customer is the entity paying for your product or service. The end user is the person engaging with that product or service. So this is, I think this is a more common theme for impact ventures, um, and especially clarifying for audiences uh, maybe in the U.S. who are less familiar with the challenges of launching in a frontier emerging market um, versus people who are kind of in those markets all the time. So um, a good example of this is usually education products and services. Um, the customer who's buying it is the school system, it's the parent, um, it's the principal or administrator who has to buy into that. Um, the end user is the student. So you have to make sure that the end user is going to like it and use it. And, ben and there's going to be the outcome that you want, your theory of change, um, and you have to make sure that the customer finds it um, worth the resource allocation. No. That's weird. Why is that showing up like that? Um, but these companies are kind of examples of that. So um, this is the icon for dot .learn. They're, they may be changing their name, so I don't have it here. But that's a company in um, West Africa that started with they came up with a technol or a way to um, vectorize videos. So they've taken Khan Academy content, Coursera con styles of learning videos, and they've made it possible for students to download them on 2G networks and then watch the content offline. Um, so they had to make this service available to students with um, very low incomes who wanted to study for the WASI high school and college exams in West Africa. What are these guys called? Dot Learn. Dot Learn. They were at the Legatum Center? They, they were. They were. Um, they one of them was a Legatum fellow. Um, so they they launched in Ghana. They're scaling in Lagos, Nigeria right now. That's fantastic. Yep. So that's so that's so that's an example of the content they started with. They're not trying to create their own content, but basically what they had to do to get buy-in is they had to figure out what are students willing to pay for this. 
and then they and then that was the constraint that they had to operate within so students in this case um, students were end users and customers um, we can get to stakeholder engagement and talk about how they engage the telecom companies to do that because basically they're using the network bandwidth to download they had to compress the video so they were using as little bandwidth as possible um, but they had to get buy-in from all these people they only in this case they have one customer and end user the student but they also had to get um, support from other stakeholders um, play business is a crowd equity crowdfunding platform in Mexico so they actually have two kinds of customers they have investors who are willing to put up to I think 100 pesos a month towards new ventures and they also have the ventures themselves so they have to kind of can make sure they have um, a high enough or a broad enough pool of um, companies and startups seeking small-scale investment and they have to have enough investors who are interested in supporting them at different stages so these are just things to think about um, going through and then Sanergy is a company in um, Ni uh, Ni yeah, Nairobi Kenya is anyone familiar with Sanergy scale a little bit but basically um, they have a system they have the fresh life toilets and so they provide clean healthy safe sanitation in areas where there's no plumbing infrastructure um, they then collect the waste and they use it to make anim high protein animal feed um, so they have a very interesting well. business model so if you're thinking about um, you know you heard ESG factors you may have a different couple of different sets of clients you're trying to um, satisfy, you know, unchained, you're communicating to different audiences, and then with the um, children and skill development. You have the children, you have the universities, or you have the students, the universities, and then um, the um, employers. All right, um, what is the challenge? So again, so you have to know who your customers are, and you have to know their challenges. Um, so you should be able to stay, state um, briefly, you know, in Atlantis, this is the challenge because of this factor. And then you want to lead into your solutions. Um, OK, that's a, not a great picture of an aqueduct. But <laughs> so your solution bridges this gap where there's, there's nothing in the market that's available. Um, and that's your value proposition. And OK, and then go into your business model. So I think Siraj said you all co covered business models earlier today. Um, so you're, yeah. So your business model is how, um, how does your customer find you, um, what do you offer, um, and how do you generate revenue? How is this sustainable? Direct sales, um, subscriptions, are you a business to business? Are you business to customer direct? Are you offering a solution for governments and you're, you know, so you're a payments provider or something or a transfer system, so you're government to person. Um, these are all different things to think about that your audience may be interested in. Do we have these slides? Um, I, yeah, I can PDF them and send them to Saraj, yep. Um, who are the stakeholders? So I think you've, have you done the um, ecosystem map? They've, A little bit? Competitive mapping. Competitive mapping, okay. Um, so stakeholders, this goes a little bit back to what I was saying, kind of about understanding your customer and your end user, um, but then it's, also broader so um, supply chain partners um, government agencies so you may be competing with a government agency um, or they may be a partner um, retail partners if you're you know doing a, a payment system and s someone's going in a remote area to a store to facilitate a cash transaction um, your employees so different areas of the world have um, different business models with respect to employee engagement um, and the role of employees in the um, management structure. Um, are there other stakeholders that are relevant to your venture, to your company? Yes, no? Students, university. Yeah, okay, yeah. So thinking about, yeah, um, where are they and, and what's their role in the six? There's and the success of your venture. Um, let's see, any notes on this one? Um, yeah, one another way to kind of think about this is to just make a, a map because you don't, you know, you don't know. In some cases, there are people. Oh, sorry. Did you? I, yeah. I was just going to say that this is the this is the mapping exercise that that you guys have done with, with respect to the map of the problem, mm -hmm. and so it uh, basically includes stakeholders that. 
that are related to, to that current user journey. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had a company, uh, Recall, a few years ago, and they had an interesting challenge. They had to deal with um, parties in their eco they were operating in Pakistan, um, Thailand, they were looking to expand into China, and they were, um, so their business model is an online platform through which farmers can buy um, seeds, soil conditioners, fertilizers, and then they were going to provide the financing, and then, you know, the idea is they, farmers receive a better, or gain a better yield, they can command a higher price, they can get more market share. But there were middlemen in these informal agriculture markets and they did not want Recall to succeed. So though they weren't contributing in a, you know, a positive way to the venture, but they had to be aware of how to deal with the challenge of um, kind of informal middlemen who were gonna lose out in this, if Recall were to succeed. Um, so that was an interesting, that's just something to be aware of. Um, the regulatory framework. So are there, um, are there local regulations? Are there norms? Are there things that aren't codified? So these, you know, there may be clearly outlined um, laws and regulations. Um, there may not be, and that's more of a challenge to figure out um, um, in terms of your venture. I'm not sure if that directly impacts any ventures here. Um, but where is your company registered? So um, is, it in, is it in Delaware? Is it in Massachusetts? Is it a B corporation? Is it in New York? Um, international companies? Being in New York is an advantage because you have protections of treaty laws. Um, what is the form of your corporation? You know, LLC, proprietorship, partnership. Um, those are things that your audience is going to be interested in. Um, let's see. Um, oh, is it, do you, and if you have subsidiaries, so just to be aware of. So um, some areas having a Nonprofit is a different distinction, different definition than it is here in the U.S. So, if you're registered in a nonprofit in the U.S. and you're going to be collecting funds and then dispersing them for overseas operations, um, what does that sister agency, subsidiary, um, or organization look like, and how is it structured? Because you don't want to be in a situation where you raise funds and then the government there finds out, or some sort of agency there finds out what you're doing and they turn off your bank account. <laughs> Um, your team, who is on your executive team? Um, if you have board members and advisors, um, those may be um, individuals you want to include. Um, the team slide, if you're doing a presentation, so if you're maybe earlier stage, you're getting started, and, or you have um, a venture that's you know, engineering, or, or you're coming up with a new product, and you have someone with a very strong science background, it may be worth it to include that slide earlier. Um, if your product or your service itself is more developed, you've done some pilots and you have some other data, then sometimes the people will put the team slide at the end. So um, just figure out what you're comfortable with. Um, funding and in-kind resources um, have you received? So if you've raised money, um, you know, being part of Bombilo is important. Um, grants and prizes, friends and family, revenue. Um, the founder of Stonyfield Farms, um, Gary, Gary Herschel, um, gave a podcast and he said that he took most of his money from his mother-in-law early on and investors really liked that because they knew that he was going to pay back his mother-in-law <laughs> and he was going to make sure that the yogurt company succeeded. Um, so, so yeah, so don't, you know, don't just say, oh, I've, I've only got friends and family money or savings because um, you want to communicate that you are personally invested, that your, if your family is invested, um, if you have close friends, because you're going to be less likely to walk away from a company <laughs> um, if you have a real personal stake in it. Um, and then, let's see. Um, so next steps. Um, so uh, you, you're trying to raise funding, you're trying to um, recruit team members, you're trying to form partnerships for a reason. Um, that's because you want to move to the next level. So clarify what's next for your venture, um, plans for scale, opening in new markets. Um, do you just want to grow, reach more customers and develop your product? Um, that kind of thing. Um, and then all pitches should end with an ask. So you want money, what are you going to do with the money? Um, you know, what will you do with another executive member? Um, 
what will you do if someone can help you um, move in, you know, you're ex dot learn, you're in Ghana, you want to expand into Nigeria. Um, so they had to go and pitch this to Nigerian telecoms. So what are, you know, we need you to let, to, you know, give us this deal on your network so that we can reach more students. Um, so yeah. Um, any questions about this, the slides or the recommendations? Like Pretty straightforward. Yeah. I love it if there's a data set to be like, like yeah, like a real data saying that it works. But do you, do you kind of steal the best things? Yeah. Um, so I would, yeah, you don't, you don't want to try to mold yourself into what worked for someone else. I would say just search, you know, search for different things. Watch things on YouTube. I'd say watching YouTube pitches is probably pretty helpful because you can see how people present data. Um, in a few slides, I have an example of someone who um, did a very effective job of communicating with data um, when she was launch launching a venture that she did not found, and that she, and it was in a market that she's not from. So she did a really good job of um, of kind of doing that. But I don't know that there's a single repository. But I think um, Harvard Business Review has good resources. Fast Company, Entrepreneur.com are some of the, the basic ones. And also just going to pitch events in person, you can see kind of what works and what doesn't work. Right. Um, appendices, so this is where you can have your financial statements, projections, memoranda of understanding, um, things that investors or um, others may want to see, but they don't, they don't necessarily fit into your story or your narrative. Um, but you should be prepared to refer to them if need be. Um, All right, just a few things on presentations. Uh, Nonverbal communication is important. Um, design details add value to your pitch. Um, good design details add value <laughs> to your pitch. Um, not so great design details may detract from your pitch. Um, so these are two logos. Um, and so the reason I have them here is because there's um, there's something called the Superman pose, but I included Wonder Woman because I <laughs> knew there were a few others. Um, so if you, um, one thing you can do is if you're going to go out and you're, you're pitching on a big audience, um, just go in the bathroom and actually raise your hands up above your head <laughs> and then stand with your feet shoulder width apart and just do this a few times. And there's some science that it actually changes your body chemistry and it gets you in more of a mindset um, and a physical to kind of do this. So that's just, just a suggestion. Um, you can try it. It helps you wake up. It's you know good for <laughs> doing this. <laughs> we'll do it later. Yeah. We'll see if they follow us. It's the pose. <laughs> yeah, it's the power pose. So it's called the, it's Superman or Wonder Woman. Um, all right, um, just a few things on communicating with the <coughs> data. So um, simple graphs and charts are usually most effective. You know, if we can make 3D multicolored bar charts in Excel, but they don't always look great on a PowerPoint screen. Um, if you have something that's kind of complicated, sometimes I don't, I don't know a lot of the details about your ESG business, but um, you know if you're doing triangulated payments, um, then ha just having a diagram to map that out is sometimes very helpful. Um, numbers, just round them for simplicity. So if you're talking about millions of dollars. <laughs> It's okay to just say seven million, not seven million, three hundred twenty-five thousand sixty-five and twelve cents, because <laughs> that's just um, distracting. And then um, this is the YouTube example I have. Vacation costs on a daily basis, but they impact all of our lives here every single day. For example, most of us probably eat about three meals a day every single day of the week. Maybe a few more if it's finals week and you're staying at home late, right? Now, what if I were to tell you that groceries had gotten so expensive that you could only afford to eat four days a week? And that if you ate any more than that, you would be giving up gas money to get to work, or rent payments, or payments on your school loans. What would you choose to give up? This is the question.
question that the 400 million people in the East African region are having to answer every single day. And they're having to answer this question because freight transportation in East Africa is so incredibly expensive that it makes up 40% of the cost of goods. And that is an incredibly astoundingly high number. For comparison, freight transportation in a country like the United States makes up 2% at max. And when consumers are forced to choose between groceries and gas, that doesn't just hurt their lifestyles, it hurts the growing economy of these regions as well. Now, my team at Kumwe Logistics saw this research and we wondered, why is freight logistics so expensive? Where is that 38% coming from? And so we traveled to Rwanda. And we saw that that 38% is coming from markets like these. Crazy, hectic, dangerous affairs. There's a guy up there on a truck. It's not safe. <laughs> and it's making the trade transportation market in, this in these countries inefficient and expensive. If you are a shipper and you want to move goods, you have to go to one of these markets. And if you are a truck owner and you want a job, you have to go to one of these markets and sit there and hope that someone will contract with you. Like I said, it's inefficient. And it's, and it's expensive. And this is where Kumwe Logistics comes in. So Kumwe is taking that crazy marketplace that you just saw and formalizing it into an online market. We are connecting shippers with truck owners. Okay, so this is, yeah, so this covers a lot of things. So um, Macaulay, um, as I said, she's not from Rwanda. Um, she'd only been to Rwanda once and she had joined the Kumwe team um, after it was founded. So she wasn't one of the original founders but she figured out how to communicate the challenge. So you saw the, um, the diagram of, you know, this is how many meals we're used to eating every day because our, freight, our transportation costs are so low. And if you're in Rwanda, this is what you may have to give up. Um, and then she used a couple of effective photos from their trip. And then this is what I mean by a diagram. So they connect shippers and truck owners. They have, a, a more complicated back-end way of doing that that involves a lot of computer science um, and coding. But she didn't go into that. She just said, you know, this is what we do. We make a more efficient process. She showed the chaos of the market, um, and this is a simpler interface. So um, just a couple of quick, yeah, these are kind of things you can see um, just that by awesome. Googling yeah. YouTube. Yeah, yeah, I'm a little bit biased toward the MIT Delta V <laughs> um, pitches, but if you want to see examples of different things, um, you can go to YouTube and search for those. Um, you know, as, as you're going through this and talking about this, all this, because we've always we've been talking about like how do we acquire a customer, mm -hmm. and you're talking about knowing your audience and innovating, and it, all this same stuff applies to acquiring a customer. So, you know, talking to them the right way, right. you just feel like it's all related. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then um, the last thing I'll point out is kind of um, their use of color. So they came up with a simple color scheme. Um, what you get? Um, so they, so the Delta V teams um, all get a, a fixed amount of funding um, for participation, and then um, basically it's a lead into other. The goal is for them to be able to launch, and so it's a lead into preparing for meeting with other investors. Um, the company's still active, I believe. Did that? Um, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, just a few things on colors and design. So, um, thinking about color choices again. Um, Fast Company has a, a very concise article, and then they go through um, kind of the whole um, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet color scheme. Um, I just pulled out yellow and blue, but you can see, you know, they give you examples of companies that have used them. Um, the personality and emotions they evoke, um, blue. So this actually kind of ties back into Maslow. So if you want people to feel warm and comfortable, maybe use purple. If you want people to feel awake and, you know, use green. And so um, you noticed uh, the Kumwe team chose green, yellow, and blue. So, you know, they wanted to look environmentalism. They were working with agriculture companies. Um, they wanted to, you know, think about recycling and um, that kind of thing. So. so is that just for the presentation or is that part of their brand as well? It's part of their brand as well, yeah. So, um, you know, I ideally you want to get to a point where your presentation and your brand and your logo all do that. 
Um, and a lot of companies experiment. So I showed you the dot learn logo earlier. Um, and you know, it, sometimes you know it's white on a black background. It's you know, so having different, you know, having the shape, the form of the logo, and then having something that appears well on a, a dark background, on a light background. Um, thinking about your website, is it going to be helix and scrolling, or you know, <laughs> I mean, these are um, you know things that make a difference. Um, yeah, and then kind of just doing slight A/B testing, so showing people different versions and seeing which they prefer. Okay. Um, any questions on? I, we can. There's a whole other world of branding and color advice, um, but I just want you know for purposes I think of, of where you are, just to point out some online resources that are readily available. Um, all right. Um, and practicing. So um, David Auerbach, who's the co-founder of Sanergy, which I mentioned earlier, came and spoke on Tuesday. Um, he said, just learn every question everyone is going to ask and have good answers. <laughs> and the best way to do that is um, to just go out and get beat up a little bit by, <laughs> um, by your audience. Um, so with that, um,